Hey young RPG fans, today I'm going to continue my dissection of the RPG series with episode 2, RPG Villains. Um, it's no surprise that a lot of people appreciate uh, villains in an RPG because there's just so many that are well written and truly memorable to the point when you remember a game you remember the villain uh, more than anything else. For Final Fantasy 7, that's an absolute definite. Even people who are not RPG fans and may have played Final Fantasy 7, they absolutely love Sephiroth. And all it takes is, you know, whenever someone thinks of Final Fantasy 7, they'll probably think of Sephiroth because he's just that popular. And he, through the ages, he's won Best Villain Awards and everything. And so he should. He's a very well written character. I know a lot of other fans bag on him never been a mama's boy and everything but that's pretty juvenile there's no really great um, debate there why he's inferior I personally think he's a well-written character and to the point that he truly made that experience memorable there's so many great elements in Final Fantasy 7 but he was the most prominent I believe and that's a fantastic example of a villain written well and Final Fantasy usually does well in that department sometimes but usually it's the case so first up I'm gonna talk about the artistic merit of a villain visually now whenever a artist has to basically create the villain it's a no-brainer that if it wants to make the villain stand out, he has to pretty much grab your attention. He has to look more superior than any other character in the game. You just have to take a look at him and just be in absolute awe. And if you are looking at the character in absolute awe, then they've done a good job. But it's up to the developer where they want to pretty much give the player the indication that, hey, this character here might be the central antagonist. You know, he might be up to no good. He looks diabolical. You know, if they don't want the player to know that that person is a villain, then they're going to make him uh, blend in a bit more and not make him stand out just yet. You know, it, intricate things, you know, come into play like uh, their equipment, uh, what colours their hair, you know, what, how old are they, all these things. And of course, it is a minor part compared to actually writing the villain in question story-wise, but it, it gives you an initial thought when you look at the villain and just have a guess. Even if they don't haven't told you yet that that character is the villain in question, it's good when you kind of can make an assumption just by their visuals. And a great villain will have you thinking the moment that you see the villain for the first time. A great RPG villain will have great RPG villain music. There are so many great villains that have fantastic themes that accompany them. Uh, again, I'm going to use Final Fantasy as a reference because back in the days, good old Nobuo Uematsu created some fantastic, memorable tracks from Golbez, Clad in Darkness, uh, to Sephiroth's theme. I always knew that theme, but it's kind of forgotten. Damn. And, you know, there's the succession of witches. That's a fantastic theme from Final Fantasy VIII. But it, it adds to... The char it adds to the character, it really does. And at, at a point, if the music's so good, it can create a real surreal, very threatening, very powerful atmosphere. Uh, Golbez Clad in the Dark does that. Um, pretty much just blasts in your face, and you're just going, wow, it's such a fantastic piece of music. Even um, the original Super Nintendo... Uh, version was fantastic. It was probably my favorite track of the entire game. And it just exuded power, it exuded terror and all this stuff. And that really helped bring across a certain perspective of the villain. Um, you know, who the villain is and it adds to it. So it is really paramount. And what is also paramount is great villain battle music. Um, Great villain battle music will have you remembering the fight more if you then trying to visualize it. I've remembered so many great fights just basically from remembering the music. 
Uh, and of course, this piece of music has to stand out from any other, you know, piece of battle music. This necessarily doesn't have to be the final battle theme, but it has to be a theme that pretty much incorporates that you are fighting this character at last. You know, and truly make that fight memorable. Uh, a great example is the Purification of Darkness from Grandia 2. Fantastic, amazing piece of music. Every time I listen to it, I remember the fight against Melfus. Um, that tune actually plays when you fight all the main sort of villains of the game, but it was most paramount in the fight with Melfus. So that's music, you know, adding, if not owning that scene so so I've talked about the visuals and I've talked about the audio now let's talk about the story that comes to villain and the plot devices are used and the archetypes used so when writing an RPG villain comes into question how often do you want the villain to appear in the game how much information do you want this villain to give to the player where it's behind the scenes scheming or in their face you know the villain could be behind the shadows for the entire game and you don't witness him or you know encounter him until the end of the game he could be behind the looking glass seeing every step that your character and the party is making you know you get to see him scheming and plotting but there's no interaction until later on. The villain might be in your face throughout the entire game, every step of the way. The villain may be a close friend that you thought was an ally, turns into your enemy later in the game. Just There are so many different archetypes that are used when creating villains. Now, there's really no cookie-cutter way of doing things these days. Um, if you were to ask me what I think is the most basic villain without going into too much detail, the ultimate black and white, evil king wants to rule the world, the end. That that to me is very simplistic, that is very black and white. It's how, um, I'd say most games were done back in the day, but at the same time they tried to add a little bit more um, flair to everything. A good example of an evil king done right is Lassic from Fancy Star. Um, it's no secret if you um, watch my videos, you know that Fancy Star is my first ever RPG, and I was only six when I witnessed it. I didn't get to play it much, but I physically did get to play it now and then. But I did have my brother and my dad next to me, helping me along, telling me what's happening in the story. But the good thing about Lastic is he's the ultimate in the shadows character, which I like to portray. Um, basically, you don't encounter him until near the end of the game. And the only thing you've got to go by is just various information given, you, given to you by the townspeople and the initial information given to you at the start of the game where Alice hears his, her brother's dying words and finds out that Lassic is behind everything. So essentially that's the main focus of Fa Fantasy Star is to track down Lassic and make him pay for his crimes. Although this day and age it would be considered very simplistic, um, it was truly mesmerizing back when I was six watching it, because when we did confront Lassic, it was such a surreal moment and it stood out from the rest of the game. Um, that's it done well, because there's nothing worse than actually having a villain in the shadows and it being m underwhelming. But that can also be the player's fault for overhyping things. I've known I've done that in the past where I've overhyped a certain character I thought was to be um, an almighty force to be reckoned with. And if you want to know what game that was, that was Final Fantasy X. I kind of made an assumption and overhyped myself. And when um, I encountered that being in question, I was let down quite substantially. <laughs> so, uh, so one thing we'll talk about now is the villain's motivations. Why is he doing this? Why is he performing acts of evil? Is he power hungry? Is he getting revenge? Uh, does he want to change things for the better or for himself? You know, just little 
intricate details makes it great because we have moved a long way from the black and white villains of the old days and we're moving closer to really diverse characters with lots of shades of grey, you know. The the villain in question might redeem himself at the end of the game depending on the events that might unfold. A certain character might turn evil for the tragedies that might unfold and betray the party, you know. So the developers do a good job of writing a very diverse villain and I, I like it when I can actually sympathize with the villain. I really like it when the connection is like that because usually the villain is there to have you loathe him have him you know want to destroy him or her or it and that's probably the main focus that most developers want but then some developers will stray off that path and write a really complex character where you can feel different emotions about and different opinions about um, but just another villain I want to touch up upon that I think is written really, really well, and he's absolutely diabolical, is my favorite villain of all time, and that's Luca Blight from Suicone 2. And if you've played the game, you know that he's absolutely insane. He is very genocidal. He's the most genocidal character ever in a video game. He only lives to kill others and just burn their villages down and make them suffer. That's the only thing that, you know, gives him purpose and gives him enjoyment and that makes him a very twisted um, force of nature. Now, what happened was, is after I beat the game, I did a little more research into the story of Suicone 2 because I absolutely love it. And I found a little backstory about Luca Blight and this is what made him a more three-dimensional, more grey, shades of grey character, is that in his backstory, when he was a kid, his mother was uh, ravaged by the enemies of his kingdom, which was the Justin city-state. And the Justin city-state back in those days was ruled by a very um, disgusting individual, I should say. And he basically ordered these thugs to pretty much ravish the Queen of Highland, and unfortunately, Luca, only being a small lad, was actually, actually witnessed the whole ordeal in question. And it pretty much screwed him up for life. It, you know, he was in shock. And when he came out of it and grew up, he just had an unyielding hatred for the city-state. So, um, that gave him more character. And of course, the one of the most memorable things for Luca is when he meets his end. I'm not going to tell you how he meets his end, but my god, is it one of the best sequences ever in RPG history. It just, it, you know, he, it's one for the record books. I just have to tell you that you have to play the game and witness it for yourself. So I've just touched upon some uh, elements that make villains great. I, I could go for ages. I can go for another talk about another video on this and I probably will in the future because it's such a broad subject and there's, there's lots to talk about but I think I'll actually leave it for there uh, guys can you comment down below and tell me some of your favorite villains and why they're your favorite villains um, just in the comments down below I'm actually very interested in finding out and since I've played a lot of RPGs, I could pretty much talk to you about it because I probably know who you're talking about. But, so that pretty much wraps up episode 2 of Dissecting the RPG. I'm actually going to do a checklist video next where I'm going to actually show you guys the list of games that I have and the list of games that I need to get. So until then, thanks for watching.